see it as a reality. And it looks a lot like the visions of science fiction films. Giga cities are soon to be. In the midst of this cold, bleak vision of the future, we have the human being. It is personal, warm, social. Nobody knew that the way we built cities had any influence on lifestyles and people's life. I think we made a lot of the same mistakes as the uh, Western countries has made. We're living in a world that's choked with traffic everywhere, where we've made our own human living environment deadly for people. Dhaka is the fastest growing city in the world. Half a million people move here from the countryside every year. A group of activists have translated Jan Gehl's books. They have introduced his methods of counting pedestrians, rickshaws and public life to inspire a different approach to planning. The policies and the planning when it comes from the top, it never understand the very aspiration of the people. So when we're doing it, you have encompassed only the rich people or upper middle income people. Rest of the people who actually dominated in terms of number has been left out. Because unfortunately, that if you don't encompass everybody into your planning and understanding of transportation, housing, you actually walking towards a chaos created by yourself. As I see the scenery, the city planning has been going on for quite a number of years with a rather incomplete toolbox. We always did the old cities in five kilometer an hour scale. That means that when you move at five kilometer an hour walking, you can see the people you are sort of squeezed a little bit together. And it's a very sensual and interesting world. You can see all the details. There are colors, there are smells, there are acoustics, which are very interesting. If you go to a modern housing area, it suddenly makes sense that much of the stuff in the suburbs are made so that the cars would be happy when going 60 kilometers an hour. That's a completely different scale from the scale of the walking man. A hundred years ago or 60 years ago, the car was new. It, it held the promise for the future. It seemed to be the way of progress. Now we've grown up. We've seen what a fully built out automobile world is like. And we've, we've failed. In 2007, the methods of studying people and public life were taken to New York. The DOT had never measured pedestrian traffic. You know, they had never, um, they'd only been counting cars. They had no quantitative tools for measuring, you know, the pedestrian experience. And that's what Yen helped us do. Get the baseline data, set some targets, now let's plan our street to meet them. Ninety percent of the roadway in Times Square was allocated to cars and only 10 percent to people. And yet 90 percent of the people who use the space were pedestrians and only 10 percent cars. So we needed to change the math. What? Times Square has no square. 89% uh, of it isn't even a square. That's, that's uh, very simple to understand. And, you know, people can react to it and demand more. No place to sit along Broadway. Everyone understands uh, that, that's, that that's a real shame. So we were able to, I think, with some very simple observations, frame them in a, in a political context that allowed everyone to say, you, you know what, this street is underperforming. This is not worthy of a world-class city.
you know what? My idea of a city has just been transformed. My idea of a city street is now different than it was before. And that's precisely what America needs right now because we have had this love affair with the automobile, you know, for a hundred years and, you know, the oil's running out and, uh, you know, people want a different lifestyle. If you see life, if you see how it grows, then when you grow up, you will take care of lives of others. When we make a city into a place where you don't walk, your kids don't walk, you are raising generations. When they grow up, they will be not human. We have 3.6 billion people living in cities today, 50% of the world's population. That's going to ri rise to 6.5 billion people by 2050. We're almost going to have to double the urban capacity of our cities in 40 years. And if we start to address how we make people happy, how we make our cities financially viable, the only way is to look at cities very carefully and understand how they work. We haven't got the time or money to build the infrastructure we'll need for the capacity we need in the next 50 years. So we'll have to look at our city and start to think about how do you do more with less? So when does the question coming what is the uh, definition of modernity what is the definition of being modern now we have started the journey now we are in the middle of the bridge now I can set up my journey okay which way I can go Thank you so much for the invitation to come and talk here in Boston at this very important time in, in your leadership shift. I'm very, very proud of that and happy about that invitation coming all the way from Copenhagen. So thank you for, uh, to, to Boston Society of Architects. Um, you might think, why on earth is Helle showing us uh, images here in the beginning from Bangladesh? What has that to do with us? Or you might think, uh, oh, this friend of ours, Gordon, uh, Mark Gordon from New York, isn't he a little bit over the top saying that our environment has become deadly to people? Well, the reason I wanted to show you this film is because we do work all over the world um, as, a, as a firm, but most importantly, I was asked to come and talk about pedestrian and bike systems today. But to me, it's never only about systems. It's not about uh, pedestrians and bicycles as a way of transport. It really is about how we design cities for people and how those systems support our way of life. So transport for me is all about choice. And that is uh, what I'm aiming to, to show you some pictures about today. So I'll run through some different <coughs> suggestions or ways of designing from uh, different parts of the world. And then we can open up for questions towards the end. So. Jan, that you saw in the video clip before, um, he is the equivalent of uh, Jane Jacobs in, uh, in North, North America. Uh, he is our Jane Jacobs in Scandinavia, <laughs> you could say. Uh, Jan really started to react to the whole modernistic, uh, um, modernism uh, uh, in the 60s. He wrote a book called Life Between Buildings that came out uh, already in 72, but he started his studies uh, throughout the 60s, where he was trying to react to the, the uh, social housing blocks that came in, uh, the, the districts in Copenhagen and other places that were torn down uh, to, to, to rebuild these new modern developments that would come in, and the elevated highways and so forth. Uh, 
Luckily, Jan actually was part of a movement that got some of these great projects stopped in Copenhagen at a time when they had actually already been detailed and some things had been torn down. So uh, throughout his life, Jan has been an academic. He's been writing books about these themes until uh, May of 2000, when um, Jan and I started the office together. So um, ever since uh, then, I was only 28 at the time, and Jan was already 64. So my ambition was to uh, try and take some of Jan's principles that he had been writing about for so many years and transform that into practice simply a way of working uh, which was much more integrated um, across transport and, and planning, urban design and architecture. The Gill approach uh, to, to make it very, very uh, simple, you could say it's about people, process and pilots. It's really about making people visible uh, by, by measuring uh, the activities that are taking place in, in, uh, in the streets, that, as you saw in the film. Uh, process, it's about it, uh, reaching or obtaining innovation through design and dialogue. And then pilots, a way of engaging people in one-to-one -one and having this measure, uh, test and refine process where we actually use the city as a tool to, to, to engage and test new, new, new design ways. I very strongly believe that there is a close relationship with how the city is designed and how we, how we behave as people. Uh, there is this saying that first we shape our buildings and then they shape us. And that saying is very true. And we see it in all the public life surveys that we do around the world. So for me, walking, cycling and public transport always comes together with public space as the enabler in, in, in the city. The greatest balancing act I see, I see that we have in cities today, uh, apart from the social imbalance, is traffic. In cities like, in mega cities like, uh, like uh, Mexico City, where we have done a bicycle strategy and toolbox, people use uh, at least two and a half hours in transport every day, and it has a great impact on not just their quality of life, but their, their health. Mexico has the second largest uh, or highest obesity rate in the world um, after the US. <laughs> <laughs> and yet 80% uh, of, uh, of all trips are below eight kilometers. And it's easy to bike. Uh, that short of a distance. And I would argue that you could actually do it much quicker than you can do in car. Often you only travel in car 13 kilometers an hour because there is so much congestion. And you can bicycle easily 13, 15 or 20 kilometers an hour. I think we have optimized our cities for cars. This image is from Dubai and there is a lot of buildings that are uh, green or uh, uh, lead certificate, gold platinum, on whatever it's called. But that doesn't mean that the city itself is sustainable. So we need to expand our, uh, our knowledge or perception of what is a sustainable city because it goes beyond the individual building and it includes the entire neighborhood, the district, and in fact the city as an overall regional entity. I would argue that there is an urgent need in cities today of much more complete systems. And what is so wonderful about the biking and pedestrian systems in Copenhagen that I'm going to show you is that people, uh, faces, are found in the streets today. Earlier we had people sitting inside of cars and the city was a much different feel. But now people are moving about, it's become a much more lively and a much more safe city today. So planning and walking is not just about transport, it's not just about getting people from A to B. Of course that's important, and the efficiency of that system is important. But it's about, it's about our way of life. It's about the, 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 the choices that we have uh, in terms of getting around in the city. We tend to measure what we care about. Every company will have key performance indicators 
and we will set up economic goals that we are measuring, or cities would have key performance indicators or measure the number of cars um, that we are expecting or planning for in the streets. I bet every city has a planning department that does that. But no cities, um, very few cities that I have worked with uh, and that I know of, would have a, a, a department, for example, for city life, or do systematic countings or measurements of number of pedestrians in streets, uh, quality of life aspects in streets. So we really need to change our, our focus here. We need to measure what we care about. And if we care about quality of life for people in streets, that's what we need to have some, some numbers for. We've had great success in the cities where we have worked to actually have some of the data to support some of our qualitative um, arguments, you could say, because a lot of politicians, they actually like to see how, uh, how design impacts their political goals. So data is key, I think, in terms of both understanding how a space performs, how the city performs, but also as a comparative uh, element if you want to, co to compare how you're doing uh, compared to other cities around the world. Making these public life surveys is also a way of making people more visible in our planning process. There is a tendency to uh, to people to be invisible. We talk about all the physical stuff. We talk about uh, how to plan for the cars, how to design the spaces, what type of buildings to come in. Uh, but we, we kind of forget the public life issues. And we try to, in our office, to turn that process around. So instead of starting with the buildings, we start with the life. A careful programming of who are we designing for? What should they be able to do? And based on that program, we can design complete streets and complete um, networks of public spaces and mobility that supports it. And then we can much easier go to the architect afterwards and say, we need your new building to address this space in this manner so that we can support this type of life and not the other way around. So instead of buildings, space, life, we should turn those processes upside down and have life space buildings. Planning is very much about understanding how the city operates at an eye level. I think there is much too much planning that is kind of helicopter planning, uh, where we are up uh, at a very large scale and we are overlooking uh, pieces of city and how they connect. But we need to understand the, uh, the results of those planning initiatives and how it actually looks on, an, uh, on, on street level. Our behavior uh, adapt to the environment. This is actually where Jan Gill started in the 60s, you could say. He actually went out and saw, uh, uh, observed urban behavior. Uh, and, and you can see here the, the old ladies that are actually afraid to, to cross the street. So they, they, they go to the, to the middle area and they stand there until they're, they're, they're uh, big enough as a group before they actually uh, have the guts to, to cross the complete street. Or the lack of benches. It doesn't mean that people don't have a need to sit down. We can take all the benches out from the city, um, but uh, people will still find secondary seating opportunities in the city. We often talk about opening up streets instead of closing. That's a term that I often meet in the US, that streets are closed uh, for traffic if we are pedestrianizing them, which I find uh, is a kind of an odd uh, uh, way of using the words. I think we should talk about opening up the streets for um, people, activities, and human interaction. This is a project we did in Brighton New Road in, in the UK, which was the first um, shared space project where you have uh, different modes of transportation happening within the same space. Another uh, a project, space project here is from Jordan, Amman, in the Middle East. This was a, a very low income uh, community with a, 
um, where there was a lot of refugees living in this area, and this was the type of space they had outside of their church, which we turned around into becoming a community uh, meeting place. So being kind to people, I think, is a very simple policy that every city should implement. It doesn't cost more than the type of planning we do today. It's about having uh, the vision and the leadership to put people in the center of planning so that we can make sure that we work in an integrated way to look at sustainability, understand how we attract uh, different types of lifestyles and activities in the city, how healthy, uh, how the, the city can be, become more healthy, more attractive also in economic terms and safe. I think everywhere we are starting to fight some of the same issues. Um, when I work in Sao Paulo or when I work in the States or when I work uh, in other parts of the world, health and obesity is becoming a, 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 a world crisis or a world phenomenon. Mobility and congestion, environmental um, and, uh, aspects and, and global warming. Those are international crises that I think physical planning can help uh, adjust. So I'm going to give you some examples from my hometown, uh, Copenhagen, um, which has done a lot of work into walking and cycling over the past many years. Today we have a, a pretty built out system of, uh, uh, of uh, bicycle routes throughout the city. So there really is a door to door connectivity and consistency from where people live and all the way into the city center. Today people commute uh, uh, about 20 kilometers from outside the city and into the city center to work. So it's been pretty constant improvements throughout many years. You can see here all the way back to the 1930s and then all the way up to today. Every year building more and more cycle tracks. And this is also supported by federal programs that would support the different municipalities around Denmark to implement these things. And here you can see an image of how it's actually done. There is a curbstone height difference uh, between the pedestrian area and the actual uh, uh, car lane that separates the bikes um, a little bit from uh, the street. You can see it here fully built out. And that little curbstone height is of course not, it's not a physical barrier, but it's enough to, uh, to, to make people feel safe. And that perception of safety uh, actually makes people, elderly people, families with kids, everybody comes out using this system. Another thing that has been implemented is that across all side streets, the sidewalks here are taken across the side streets. So here it's not the car that are coming out and then pedestrians have to stand there and wait. No, it's actually the pedestrians and the cyclists that have right of way. And then the cars have to very, very slowly go over the pedestrian uh, uh, space and into the, into the main street. And it's a subtle little thing, but I can find many, many places in the US cities, probably also in Boston, where uh, you have car exits from parking areas and you have uh, uh, sideways and, all, uh, and I don't know what, and you end up having a sidewalk which goes up and down like this, uh, and it's basically not consistent and, and coherent. So because we now have these two very built out systems for pedestrians and bi bicycles, it has really attracted a lot of different people to now use the streets. It's about inclus inclusivity, it's about fairness, it's about building a democratic city that allows everybody access to the urban, urban centers. Business people are cycling, so you see people in suits on their way to work. People of all cultures are bicycling. The municipality, they have um, a training program especially that focuses on, on immigrant women 
because we know that some of them um, have a tendency not to come out as much and they don't know how to bicycle from their own culture. So there are special training programs for them. Mothers are bicycling. About 25% of all families, they have these box bikes where the kids are now sitting in the front. And you can use that for grocery shopping as well. Fathers are bicycling, which I think is, uh, is important. And the kids are sitting in the front of that, uh, of that uh, bicycle. So they actually get, they grow up as bicyclists. They understand how it is moving about in the city in this way. And kindergartens are bicycling. The kindergartens will have box bikes where they can take the kids to different places in the, in the city. They can go to a local park or a playground or to the beach. Friends and lovers are bicycling. In fact, it's much, much easier to talk to each other and to uh, hold hands or just stop or hop off your bicycle and take a coffee on the way home from work uh, or whatever it is. You get access to the city in another way. You don't have to think about, oh, I have to park the car, I have to go into a garage, to find a parking lot, da, da, da. You're just there. I often talk about hardware and software. I would say every city that works with these things is not just about building infrastructure. It's about supporting and growing a new culture. So what we really need to do is to change the mindsets of people. I took this graph with me. It's, uh, it's in Danish, but uh, what, is, what this is showing is that from, uh, from um, the first grade in school until uh, the last grade in school, we have uh, uh, these are children, 50% of children that are coming uh, together with their parents. And that number drops. But instead, these, the black ones, these are children that are cycling themselves. So that number is actually going from 5% to about 60% uh, over these nine years. So it's really showing that people are starting from a very young age in the city, cycling and walking to school. I don't think it's very hip anymore to take your, your kids in Copenhagen to, to school in a car. In fact, in my neighborhood, uh, the other parents will sort of stand there and look a little bit at, at you if you, if you try and sort of uh, put your, put your uh, kids to school by, by car. This is the cool way of doing it. We basically use bicycles for transportation. It's not just exercise. In, in, uh, in the US, I, I meet a lot of people that would introduce themselves, I'm a bicyclist. I bicycle every day in Copenhagen and I would never introduce myself as a bicyclist. Uh, because for me, it's not about exercise. Uh, it's just a way of life. It's just about transporting myself from one place to another. And it's interesting, we use it for transportation of different things like um, I had a friend that um, was uh, playing this cello um, in, a, in an orchestra, and that cello was worth uh, 20,000 US dollars. And people would, people would say, how on earth are you cycling with that expensive instrument on your back? And then she would say, yeah, but don't you cycle with your kid? So people really think that it's a natural choice for them to do. So you see pregnant women and you see a lot of people that are cycling with, with, with kids. And we, we wear normal shoes. <laughs> we don't gear up because we're cycling to work. So this is me. This is me going to work on a Monday morning. And this is me going to the beach on Sunday. This is how we dress up when cycling in the city. So cycling has really doubled when we look back over the, the, the last 15 years. Today, um, and that number passed sometime in uh, around uh, 2003, 
we now have more cycles coming into the inner city on an everyday basis than we have cars. In fact, in the, in the actual inner city, we have about 55 of everybody coming uh, by bicycle. 55%. The Copenhagen modal split in overall, if we look at the Copenhagen region, which is, or Copenhagen, greater Copenhagen, which is like uh, 1.5 million people, uh, we have about 35% that are coming on bicycle, 26% drive their car, 32% use public transport, and then 7% are walking. So the number of people that are walking is uh, often lower in, in other cities because so many people walk uh, or, or choose to, to use their bicycle instead. And what is interesting is that these people are continuing bicycling in winter time. And I, I took this, pic uh, this picture with me because I knew it was going to be this cold in Boston. <laughs> I wanted to show you this because Boston and Copenhagen are both comparable when it comes to uh, uh, being seasonal cities. 70% continue biking at winter time. And that's not because we are Vikings. <laughs> or have special blood running in our veins or something like that. It, we, we are not any uh, special species compared to uh, the Americans. This is because the system compels them to do so. It's the easiest thing for them to do. We have prioritized maintenance. So in the streets of Copenhagen, the bicycle tracks will be cleared with special little machines like this before the car lanes. Often people are also saying, oh, but when you have that many car or that many bicycles, there's going to be a lot of fatalities. Yes, of course, there are people that are, uh, are getting into danger or even killed in traffic every year. But it's interesting to see that uh, when you look at, the, at these numbers, you can see that pedestrians uh, seriously injured in traffic <laughs> is the dark blue line. That has gone down over the past 20 years. So with critical mass, the actual number, not just a percentage, but the actual number of people killed in traffic is going down every single year. Because with the number of cyclists and pedestrians going up, there is an increased awareness with people driving. If we compare ourselves uh, in terms of accidents with other cities around Europe, you can see that Netherlands and Denmark that has a great cycling culture and community is way down here compared to Portugal, or Spain, France and Italy and other uh, other uh, more southern European cities. All this is supported by campaigns. Uh, we have a very af active cyclist uh, federation and um, there are all sorts of, uh, of funny little uh, attributes in, in the city that helps you as a, as a cyclist. Here you can see uh, that there is a, like a footrest uh, for cyclists, so when you come up to the to the cross section, there is actually instead of getting off your bike, you just <laughs> click your feet out, or or you just have a little footrest to uh, to to help you there. Uh, there is also uh, special bins, like uh, this you've seen for 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 cars as well here, but that's on the cycle track. Uh, and there's even men or women uh, hired by the municipality to sometimes campaign and help you park your bicycle in the right place. So instead of getting a fine, oh, you have parked your bicycle in the wrong place, it will cost you uh, $100, you're actually getting a little, little service sign. We have helped you park, park your bicycle here. We've cleaned your chain for you. <laughs> and we've polished the, 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 the front of your bicycle because the city wants to invite people to bicycle, not scare them away.
Integrated transport is, of course, super important. So you have to take your bicycle into the trains as well. So today you can take your bicycle for free into the local trains and also into the metro system. This has actually upped the number of bicycles even further in the city. You can also uh, take it on a taxi. Uh, it's actually required now that every taxi in Copenhagen have to have a bicycle uh, rack. So that um, if you are somewhere in the city, you've bought too many things, or you had a beer too much, or, uh, or uh, the weather has started to become really bad, you can just call a taxi and they will have uh, this, this gear on that is able to take two uh, bicycles. So coming back to measuring uh, the, the effects, Copenhagen has done a bicycle account ever since 95, every, sing, uh, every second year. So the city is out measuring, counting, interviewing, uh, finding out what they can do better, what can be improved, what they can learn from, uh, from this. So what have come out of the bicycle accounts is, for example, why do you think people bicycle? Well, 9% of the people asked are saying, we are environmentalists. We do it because we want to save the planet. But only 9%. 29% is saying, we do it because of the economy. We, we do it because it's cheap. It saves us money. But it's not, uh, as I showed you in the pictures, it's not the poor people in, in, in the city that are bicycling. 32% is saying, we do it for health. We do it for exercise. This is the way that I'm getting my daily, uh, de daily exercise as part of my commute. But 88, almost 90% of everybody asked, they say, I do it because it's easy and quick. It's, it's just uh, the, the, the quickest thing to do in the city. And that's also why the 70% uh, of the cyclists that are continuing in winter are doing it. Because in winter, it is still the quickest and the easiest way to get around town. So my argument here is that we have to design our cities and our streets in a way that we are really compelling people to do the right thing. We cannot force anyone to do anything. We are planners, we are architects. We cannot force anyone, but we can make careful invitations and make people do the right choice. There are tons of benefits to these systems. There is a 30% reduction in mortality. We save 1.7 billion Danish kroner on health every year. And cyclists actually also go shopping. Uh, funnily enough, there are some people that think that cyclists uh, are, um, must be poor people and they, they, they don't shop as much. So the shops will close or, uh, or, or whatever. There is a difference though. Uh, you can see that the, the bicyclists shop exactly as much, actually a little bit more than the ones that are driving. The difference is that the ones that drive and shop, they mostly shop once a week. They take their car, go to the supermarket, buy lots of stuff, put it in the, in the, in the back of the car and drive home. But the people that are shopping on a bike, they shop the exact same amount, but they do it maybe two or three times during the week instead. So in fact, what has happened in Copenhagen is that in many streets, our streets have been enlivened by having more bicycles coming by. We now have more bakeries and more little, little neighborhood shops than we had about 20 years ago, when all the local corner butchers and whatever it was closed down. Bicycle tracks are also about five times more efficient uh, in terms of, of cars, which is something that uh, the Copenhagen municipality has estimated. 
and we gain 1.6 euro for society per every 10 kilometer people are biking, whereas the society loses 1.5 euro per driven 10 kilometers because it costs so much more to with, with, with tain and manage uh, the road infrastructure. So there are economic and there are health and there are social benefits for these different systems in the cities. So walking and cycling, I would argue, together with the public spaces, have truly changed the quality of life in our city. It's really about building the democratic city that suppo supports inclusivity and safety and, um, and make a more uh, just city for people to access. It's easy, as I talked about before, to bring your bicycle along. So pedestrians and bicycles are really brothers and sisters in the city. In Copenhagen, more than 80% actually have a bicycle and 68% use them every week. The last point here in Copenhagen is that public space has to be de developed alongside of these systems. It never comes alone. It's part of the same package, making sure that you have wonderful public spaces that attracts people. Copenhagen didn't start with the bicycle systems. We started actually way back in the 60s. And Jan started measuring performance at the Royal Academy at the Center for Public Space Research back in 62. And this is where it started. It started with public space innovation. Our main street, this is how it looked back in the 60s. It was a lot of traffic, very congested. This is the most narrow, some places it's only 10 meters wide, other places about 16 meters wide. But it's the one thoroughfare we, we have through the medieval inner city of Copenhagen. This is how it looked back in 62. And today, after it was pedestrianized, we have 80,000 people walking here up and down this street on a normal day. In comparison with London, which is eight times bigger than Copenhagen, they have about 120,000 on Oxford Street, which is like a world-class uh, destination. So Copenhagen, having prioritized walking and cycling, has one of the highest pedestrian numbers uh, in urban centers. And this is how you can see the city was built out. We started with this little black line up there in 62. It was the first Northern European uh, experiment at the time. And that system has been fully built out so that we today have about more than 100,000 square meters of pedestrian space in the inner city. What is interesting uh, is also to, uh, to see the number of square meters and how it has gone up in comparison with the stationary activities, meaning people actually sitting down, meeting, uh, meeting for cultural activities uh, or just engaging in the city center. And those activities, you can see, have gone up with the number of square meters as well. And we have developed a new culture. Copenhageners, they love the sun uh, because we have very dark winter months. So every time when the, when the spring comes out, people will sit out and they enjoy the sun and be out in the spaces. So we have completely developed a new culture in the city. Earlier, people would say, oh, sitting outside having a coffee, that's something they do in Italy. We would never do it here. But of course, people travel and pick up uh, ways of living. And we now have public life at, at, at almost all times of year, uh, during the winter, during the fall, Christmas markets. People are getting blankets and sitting outside having uh, a warm wine or, uh, or beer, as you see in this image. So the culture has changed. These are some images before and after. You can see the, 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 the American dream here in the middle of the, of, of the picture at the, yeah, you see it here, uh, the, the old cars. And all the squares in the inner city were parking lots at the time. And today it has been transformed into spaces for people. This was the uh, piece of uh, waterfront, the old waterfront in the city, 
that had about 60 parking lots. It was not a, uh, 60, 60 parking uh, bays, not a lot of cars. But today it has become a really flexible space with lots of people activities. In fact, you can take your car through this area during winter because there's not a lot of life, but it's completely closed at summertime. To me, this image is um, kind of uh, summarizing some of the Copenhagen qualities. The fact that you, as a, a, a young mother, can walk at, at evening time, feel safe. You have the bicycles, you have the ground floors of shops open, there is new life happening. This is the type of Copenhagen feel, I would say, or social capital, you could also say, that we have developed in our city over the past 30 years. And I think Boston can do this too, because you have such a great urban fabric and you have a, a huge number of young people living in this city that wants a different lifestyle. Cities are in need of flexible design solutions to accommodate life. This used to be a bridge with lots of traffic on it. And then the city of Copenhagen widened the sidewalks. And all of a sudden, it was no longer a, a, just a bridge. It was a hangout where you, people would take their pizzas and their beer, and they would sit here and just hang out and see people moving by. Copenhagen now. And I'm very proud of this because we have worked with, the Co with Copenhagen City for the past 15 years and they asked us to help us uh, develop a vision for the city. This is the latest vision for the city to become a metropolis for people. And that's super strong. And some of the targets that are set in this vision is that we should aim for 50% of people cycling and sharing in terms of all trips. That 80% should feel safe when they cycle. And we've also set targets for walking and for staying in the city. And those targets are measured every year when it comes to people uh, walking and every second year in terms of the bicycle accounts. So Copenhagen has become a people city. I wanted to show how these examples or this methodology was taken to New York. So uh, back, as the film mentioned, in 2007, we were contacted by uh, Jeanette Sadikan that had just been appointed uh, commissioner for uh, Department of Transportation. So Jeanette and uh, Amanda Burden, who was uh, head of planning at the time, they came to visit us in Copenhagen. And uh, it was very uh, sweet because um, uh, some of the group uh, had actually only bicycled when they were very young. Uh, and Amanda herself uh, was a little bit afraid of, of cycling around in Copenhagen and all these uh, uh, maniacs, 50% uh, of people cycling, how can I deal with it? And so we actually rented tandems. So we had uh, some people uh, cycling in the front uh, from the office and, and, uh, and other people sitting in the back. So we took, uh, took the team cycling for two days around Copenhagen and they really understood the, f the, the freedom of choice uh, that you had with those systems. So uh, we got the invitation to come and help in, uh, in New York. And we started exactly the same way as in Copenhagen with surveying. So we had a lot of volunteers and young people out helping us out doing the surveys, doing the counts and so forth. Uh, and it really helped us with the political argument saying how many pedestrians there were on the sidewalks in comparison with the, with the large space that was set aside for cars. We also took a lot of, did some more qualitative uh, analysis of the cramped sidewalks and all the obstacles that were there. Somehow, more than 30% of all the facades along Broadway had scaffolding. Uh, I don't know why uh, a, a world-class street like that would have so much scaffolding, but it actually took up a lot of the space for pedestrians. 
So all of this analysis and counting and surveys were turned into uh, detailed pedestrian strategies uh, and bicycle strategies to help ease congestion. The pilot program uh, for, for Broadway um, came up. It was a, so a solution that had, be, had been discussed many years, um, but nobody had really dared to actually implement it. And yet these uh, complicated triangular squares or star-like crossings where you have Broadway crossing the regular grid, these were the places where we had the most casualties and people being killed in traffic. So the obvious way to, to thing to do was to take out the, the, the through traffic in Broadway and create different uh, new squares that were completely pedestrianized. And we worked very carefully together with the traffic planners and they calculated that we should be able to improve um, transit or expected travel time through the avenues with more than 15% by doing this. So because we could prove that we, it was an improvement in terms of flow, we were not taking any car lanes out, we were just minimizing the width of car lanes to get things in. We were able to uh, have the permit to do these temporary projects. And very little money came into it. Only about 1.5 million was the estimated cost to deliver the whole program. Just paint and, and internal work. Um, with DOT. So this is what, uh, what was delivered. You can see the bicycle uh, infrastructure with the green and then the, the, the zones for different public seating and activities. Columbus Circle was one of the areas that we, we worked with. Uh, and here you can see how that was carried out. Herald Square as well, another place where people got a lot of new space And then, of course, Times Square, as you saw in the, in the film clip in the beginning, where we had this 90% of the road space that was actually used for only 10% of the vehicles going through. Um, this is how it looked before, and this is how it was when it was implemented in 2008. So after uh, this, we actually, again, we used the methodology of surveying before and after to have the right, uh, right arguments, you could say, for making this a permanent solution. And we could prove with data that uh, we had a 17 improve, improvement in travel time. We had 11% increase in pedestrians, 63% decreases in injuries. 80% fewer pedestrians walking in the ro roadway. And most importantly, I think, 74% saying that the square had improved dramatically. And that, I think, is funny. Because we had just used paint. And sometimes we think, as architects, that we need to uh, pave with Chinese granite, or we need to come up with a uh, a giant uh, design solution. Oh, I'm thinking about an oval or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, this was pure geometry, uh, geometry. This was paint. And this tells us that people are attracted to people. People find spaces that are lively and safe and designed to accommodate their, their, their desire lines are attractive. So based on these numbers, a half a year later, uh, it was decided to make Times Square uh, a permanent uh, square. And again, the life that we saw in the area changed. Some activities that didn't happen before started to happen. Of course, you've always had the tourists there, but they had more space and could soak in the atmosphere. But what was important here was that 42% of the locals shopped more often. So it wasn't only the tourists that found this was an interesting place. It was also the locals. And there were new opportunities to sit and, and just enjoy, which caused a, an 84% increase in stationary activities. Before, people just stood up and quickly walked through. Now, there was an 84% increase where people actually sat down 
and enjoyed and talked to each other and so forth. All of this was supported by a more cultural uh, event like the Summer Streets program where um, you could cycle and walk up and down the avenues. And this, I think, is super important. This is something you can do in Boston as well to foster this new culture and, and, and invite the kids in to try how it is to just stand and use that space, uh, the, the streets where you had never been able to go. It's like in Copenhagen. I love when the lakes freeze because you can walk into that space and see your city from a new perspective, and you can stand in a space that is never, ever accessible to you, it's the same type of feeling that you can achieve with the summer program. And more importantly as well, the places when utilizing this integrated design, it becomes a much more accessible place for everybody in the city. Also. Uh, people with disabilities. This, um, ho I hope this illustrates to you this, this methodology of ours with the tra tra transitional city, learning by doing methodology where you can, w you can test things through pilot projects, you can measure the, the, the effects and the results and you can refine it before you actually spend millions of dollars to implement the, the, the final design. Something that I find is, uh, is often when we work with master planning, you, do, you, you make a drawing and you say, this is how it's going to be, it's going to be finished at this point in time, uh, and so forth, and then you in implement phase one, two, three, da, da, da. and then actually the city changes and the master plan that you did may, might not fit the city anymore. We have tons of examples like that in our urban cities. I think we need to skip that way of master planning. And we need to make clear visions. We need to have qualitative guidelines. And then we need to find a way where we can build our way through towards that vision, but in a much more flexible framework, uh, rather than having fixed plans that becomes hugely expensive and might miss the target in the end. You can use pilot projects in many, many different ways. Um, uh, you can use it to like a campaign or an event. You can use it, as I mentioned in New York, as a more transitional project where you actually test out strategies before you build it. You can also do it in terms of actually implementing a best practice example of some sort in your city. You can also use it as a more reg uh, regeneration catalyst or something like a, uh, a Kickstarter or early activation uh, in, 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 a, in an area. Or you can use it as a more tactile project that really, uh, where the goal really is to, um, to have community, community engagement and more bottom-up uh, planning in an area. So there are many, many different ways of using uh, this methodology. So in San Francisco, I have two more examples, and they're short. Um, so uh, Better Market Street was something uh, that uh, came after the Broadway project. I really think Market Street in San Francisco has the same qualities uh, and could be the Broadway of San Francisco. This is where we have two different grids meeting. It's a bus uh, corridor and, and quite a, a lot of people walking and cycling in the area, but it's also uh, it, it, this was also a place where we started with these types of surveys and looking very carefully at how people were walking in the area. And we found out that Market Street was not just one street, it was three streets in one. It had three very different characters and very three different very, um, variations in use. And that was then uh, put together so that we could see how the different modes of transportation were supporting each other and was different in the, in the three different uh, pieces of, of street. The vision was to, um, to try and extend the sidewalk, narrow the car lanes in this case, prioritize public transport, implement cycle infrastructure. Uh, but because there was uh, actually more, the, the street was wider than we actually had people, uh, we came up with this idea about having a, a street life zone 
uh, along uh, the pedestrian sidewalks where different types of activities could take place in that flexible zone. People could have exhibitions, or you could have seating, you could have uh, bus, uh, buses waiting. Uh, so it became a kind of market streetlet instead of a parklet. Of course, it was building on uh, this whole idea. This is uh, how it was implemented this year, uh, last year in, in October. It was building on this um, San Francisco tradition uh, that the, the group Rebar has been working uh, with this public realm innovation. They started the parking days that became the parklets that then became the living innovation zones in our project. The first generation parking day was really like a, a, a rooted, uh, almost guerrilla type uh, activity uh, where you could hire a parking space for a day. Uh, and this has become a world phenomenon. We are doing this in Copenhagen now and in many different European cities. The second generation became the parklets that were more of this bottom-up uh, way of engaging people. And this is really what uh, San Francisco has, has done a lot in, in uh, different streets as a way of engaging communities with very clear goals in terms of supporting active mobility. And then the third generation was the living innovation zone that we worked with in, in, in our project where we again try to root these pilot projects in a wider strategy like we did in New York. And then the final example where we have used these types of pilots was in Christchurch. I don't know how many of you know uh, the story of Christchurch, but back in February 2011, there was a big earthquake and we had just finished a public realm strategy for the city the year before and then the whole city center was destroyed, almost. 80% of all buildings had to be torn down after the quake. So only three weeks after the quake, they called us up in Copenhagen and said, can you come and help us? We need you to move down here, it's an earthquake zone, but we need you to come and help us rebuild the city and implement the public realm strategy. And that became the start of a huge engagement process over several weekends where we actually managed to collect more than 100,000 ideas. That's not like normal community engagement where you might have <laughs> 20 good ideas or if, if you're really lucky, a couple of hundred ideas. This was the soul and the heart of the city that was taken away and people everybody in the city participated and left notes and did videotapes and we got all sorts of um, ways to, um, to, to capture people's ideas. And what was important uh, to me I think was that what people voted for was to keep the historic infrastructure of the streets and the squares in the city. They didn't necessarily care so much about what type of buildings came up but the street pattern and the historic layout of some of the, of the squares and parks in the city, people felt was like the DNA uh, of the structure of the city to be restored. This is uh, how the, the backside of, uh, of uh, the river uh, that runs through the city uh, looked. And of course, uh, having a quake like this is also an opportunity to then totally rethink the, uh, the, the, the use of spaces like this. So we made uh, a vision that this river space, of course, should not be a, a car space again as it had been, but this was an opportunity to regain that space for people and create a wonderful river front all the way through the inner city. And then the idea was also to say, this is how it pretty much looked after the quake, but maybe having in the building uh, phase, because this is going to take 10, 20 years to rebuild the whole inner city. Uh, so in the meantime, we have to have some temporary projects. So this is how uh, some of the, 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 the temporary projects looked. Uh, people came into the city to, uh, to do different, uh, different things. You could go free bowling uh, here in, in the evening. 
Um, so this was really, people were taking back their city and they were creating places again, even though this was um, a zone of, uh, uh, of distortion and um, destroy. So a fantastic way of showing how you can use temporary projects also as a way of, of activating an area, an empty, an empty lot, or, or, or a whole city center, as in the case of Christchurch. Transport is about choice. It's about building a city where that offers people freedom and access for all. And it's about walking, cycling, public transport, and public space coming together. From different efficient systems, this is how cities operate. We have a parks department, we have a traffic department, we have a redevelopment agency, and all are focusing on their piece in the city. But the public realm is where everything comes together, and we need to achieve a much more holistic and joined up thinking. My recommendation to Boston would be that public life and public realm strategies need to come alongside with the different initiatives that you are working with. If you are doing a new transport pl plan for Boston, make sure that that transport plan has a public realm strategy that goes along with it, that supports this um, uh, transport innovation that I have been talking about, new behaviors, creative economy, and not, uh, to say the least, livability in the city. Public space is fundamental in every society and in every city, and it has a role. This image is from India, and the men are sitting outside the sari, sh sari shop, where the, the women are, are, are having their dresses made, and it can take hours, I can tell you, and they sit there for at least a day, but just the fact that they sit there and they look at the, at the life that goes by, that happens in India, it happens in Boston, it happens in Copenhagen. Public space is important in every society. It's about building a better every day. In New York, I met these people one evening I was walking Last summer, I was attending a conference on parks. And I saw this family, and I just stopped them and said, hey, you are cycling with kids in the evening, and you know, what do you think about the cycle infrastructure and so forth? And, and this, uh, this man told me that um, a couple of years ago, uh, he had a four-wheel drive, and he would take uh, his kids to baseball uh, in, in a car. But, uh, then he sold the car and he bought a couple of bicycles. And they now live on Manhattan and this is the way they get around the city. That was a great story, I think. Mm -hmm. Because that shows us that we are changing uh, behaviors. So remember that, building a better every day. Thank you. So, do any of you have any questions? I hope it was not too long for you. <laughs> yeah? Do we need to have a, a mic, uh, Cheryl? Or This is a very long room, yeah. so... Uh, <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, no, it's on. Um, I'm curious, I don't know how long you've been in Boston, but as a planner, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the... Uh, potential for a car-free Boston, and what might be the most important thing to do first? I don't know Boston very well, uh, other than I, I think there is, uh, just uh, from the physical layout of the city, uh, you have uh, already uh, parts of the city that are very walkable. So I think it's, uh, and you have, because of that, you have uh, a community that, that, that is walking already. So. I think there is a huge potential to extend that uh, to include the whole city. Uh, I also think that uh, being a waterfront city, uh, you have a fantastic opportunity to 
uh, really develop a public space network uh, in this city that uh, both includes the waterfront but also little parks and squares. Um, and, and then, uh, as I, I've, I've understood throughout my meetings today, that uh, Boston is uh, operating very much on a, at a regional scale as well. Uh, and I think you can turn that into your advantage instead of having, uh, having it as a, as a disadvantage where people have long commutes. If you really uh, uh, up the, 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 the public transport and make sure that people can get to it and densify around uh, some, some uh, small centers, then uh, I think it's, uh, it can be turned to a quality that you have quick access to, to green space as well. Uh, so uh, earlier in the presentation, you talked about the idea of opening up streets mm -hmm. to uh, cyclists and pedestrians. And uh, I think that's a terminology that we really need to think about adopting here. But I'm wondering if you could talk about the um, sort of maybe a little bit of the backstory of how that came to be in Copenhagen, especially at an early date like 1960, where in the US that was when we were widening streets and tearing down buildings you know, to build freeways. Um, so how did, how did the population come to uh, appreciate this idea? And uh, how was op opposition to potential changes how mm. was that um, dealt with? A lot of the new projects that you know, we would like to see, especially those of us who want to sort of open streets back up, there are a lot of people who say, no, you know, we need cars for business, we need you know, parking, et cetera. Yeah. So if you could talk about that a little bit. Well, that was exact uh, the same reaction we had been in, in Copenhagen back in the 60s. Uh, I must admit, it's something I've been told. I, I'm, I'm, I was born in 72. But, uh, <laughs> but at the time, as far as I've uh, sort of uh, researched and, and heard, uh, people would, uh, were very angry about this and thought that uh, it, would, uh, uh, it would make access to the city worse and it would uh, make business worse. Um, so actually the, the closing of our main street, that was done as an experiment. Uh, and I think what, what Copenhagen has been good at ever since is actually experimenting their way. So they would often uh, do something and say, oh, we're just doing this for a couple of years and then uh, we'll, we're going to see how it works. And, uh, and because Jan was uh, doing his research at the same time at the academy, he was actually, without having an official role in the city, he was able to support the changes that were happening. So Copenhagen never had a master plan. They just did incremental change. And they did one project uh, uh, at a time. But every single project we've had, People have uh, uh, been writing about park, parking and, and, and also small spaces. So, and they still do. Yeah. I think in New York as well as Boston. <coughs> There's been um, a little bit of controversy around um, when you separate a bike lane and you ask bikers to bike in a bike lane, whether curved or just painted, um, there's a move against having bikers in the street. And I was wondering if you could speak um, from your perspective on that. What was the first question? Helmets. Helmets. Ah, helmets. Um, well, uh, there is definitely a, a difference when we have surveyed in Copenhagen the, the perceived safety when you just have a, a painted line and when you have uh, separated tracks with the curbstone height and the perceived safety is, uh, is, is uh, I don't remember the percentage, but, but um, uh, much higher when you actually have that separation. We don't have those separations in every single street. Uh, when you go into the neighborhoods, the, the speed is reduced to 30 kilometers an hour and around school districts it's about 15 kilometers an hour. So in the areas where speed is reduced you, you just bicycle in the street basically so there is no separation. Uh, but in, in larger streets uh, I would definitely argue for, for a separation. I don't really believe in this, uh, I've worked a bit in Seattle as well where they invented this idea about sharrows 
I don't really see the idea. I mean, cyclists share car, car lanes anyway. Uh, and I don't particularly think it, it makes it uh, safer. Uh, or, or cars, uh, uh, car drivers be, be more aware. In terms of helmets, that's, uh, that's uh, a, a, an interesting question. Uh, it's not uh, obligatory or it's mandatory, as you would say, in Copenhagen to wear a helmet. Uh, the, the, the government uh, uh, supports helmets and advise people to use helmets, but it's not uh, mandatory. Because what we have seen is that the number of cyclists drop when uh, you mandatory when you are forced to wearing a helmet, and uh, actually uh, the argument is that the more people we can have cycling, uh, the 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 more safe uh, the the street is, and the the less casualties we'll have. So uh, we have felt that the number was more the the high number of cyclists were more important. Uh, so still, it's just a guidance that people should wear helmets. Today, I would say um, you see more and more people in, in Copenhagen wearing helmets, but definitely not all. Uh, but it's seldom that you would see a kid without a helmet. Almost all kids wear helmets. Um, first of all, it's wonderful to have a city designed for people rather than cars. Um, but the other thing, uh, I was just wondering, are, are bikes uh, also asked to observe a speed limit? Speed limit? Yeah, because we, we have here like the professional bikers and, and the more leisurely ones. And that, that's not always mm. easy to have both of them on the same uh, area. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you heard the, the question, but the, it was about uh, whether there are speed limits for, for bicyclists. And they're, they're not. Uh, they can go as far as, as they want. Uh, but we uh, have developed a system lately uh, com like super cycle highways. I don't know if you've heard about them, but it's like commuter, uh, r uh, com uh, more, much more of a commuter system that goes way out of the city, about 30 kilometers out. And those uh, uh, tracks uh, are inviting more of the, the, the fast driving uh, uh, bicyclists. And they tend to be more separated when, once they get out of town. Um, it's interesting because we've done some surveys about those supercycle highways and um, it's actually predominantly men that uses them. And what is interesting uh, is that uh, at night, for example, uh, if women can choose either a supercycle highway that kind of goes on the back of rail sites and everything else uh, and are sort of super quick, uh, or they can choose a normal street, even though that street doesn't have cycle infrastructure. Women will choose to cycle in the normal street because they don't like being sidetracked or into these uh, different sort of back areas of the city. So uh, our office don't necessarily believe in uh, the building of uh, separate infrastructure uh, for commuting if it means that it is uh, less um, observed or, or less safe. Yeah. Oh, ch can I ask one more question? Mm -hmm. uh, you have these uh, curbs. Have you at all tried uh, just uh, putting bumps on rather than having to build an actual curb that would be uh, less expensive to build? Yeah, it's uh, not something we've done in Copenhagen. In Copenhagen, they they've, they uh, they they continue to build the same system with the curbstone. Uh, but I agree, it is a super expensive system because you have to uh, redo the draining uh, draining system in those streets. So um, what we have done when we've worked in uh, both Melbourne, um, New York, uh, Mexico City, uh, and other places, uh, the system has been more. Um, based on, on concrete bumps 
there that, that are separating uh, cars from bicyclists. We also have another issue in Copenhagen, and that is uh, that the width of our streets uh, is much less than here. So uh, having a bump, even though it's uh, maybe only 30 centimeters or 35 centimeters wide, it's actually still a little bit too wide to many of our streets. So um, yeah. You coming to me? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I was going to ask, you know, I was appreciative of the New York example because that's close by, but actually I think Boston's street grid is, is more similar to a lot of European cities that you mm -hmm. work in. Um, is it when you make that political argument for uh, closing down a street, is it often the case that you have a situation that's going to improve traffic? Or is, are there other arguments that you make over there in Europe <laughs> to make those things work? Um, <coughs> uh, yes, because um, it is proven in Copenhagen that the bicycle is a true alternative to the car. So uh, there is like no question anymore. Like if the if the city is um, have to redo infrastructure like uh, 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 lighting or sewage systems or anything like that, um, this they they would always when they put things back in again uh, make sure that if there wasn't a, a bicycle infrastructure before they would put that in as part of the, the, the project. I was actually but speaking more to the uh, closure, as you s or as you say, opening up the streets. Yeah, OK. Like on Broadway, you, know, you close down some s streets. Yeah. And that actually improved traffic. Yeah. When you do that kind of a project in, situ in cities that are more like ours, Yeah. do you find that that's possible, or is that? I think it's possible. Yeah, we have found that other places because uh, uh, in in the states you have very wide uh, laneways or, or car lanes, so uh, it is actually uh, possible to have a win-win situation where you can both optimize flow and optimize traffic and uh, put in new systems at the same time. So. Uh, uh, of course, uh, that is uh, s that can be a starting point, but it doesn't really tackle, I think, the 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 issue that you really have to at one point make a shift in prioritizing, and we can't continue to just extend the 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 car systems that we have. We have to start uh, uh, rethinking in certain places, um, but of course, it it can be a starting point. Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm very interested to hear about all of the sort of infrastructure mm. things that you've done to improve the the, the environment uh, for pedestrians and cyclists. But I'm I'm more curious about this idea of planning for people and having a public realm and a public life yeah. strategy. And I wonder how a planning department or folks that are planners or engineers or mm. architects um, have the capability to to think about social life. And what's the sort of culture shift that has to happen? Who has to be at the table to really um, enable that? And how the end user and people are involved uh, in that process? Hmm.
happening. So just the fact that you have uh, that you do a survey like that uh, in in a in a regular format um, is a way of of um, of getting people getting awareness. <coughs> Secondly, I think it's about uh, really making sure that you collaborate across, uh, for example, social departments or uh, cultural departments and and with the streets and and parks departments. Uh, what was interesting in Copenhagen that was that already in the eighties the parks department and the roads department merged into one. So uh, you could no longer just plan streets because streets were public space uh, and parks. So, um, so in that sense, uh, Copenhagen has really tried to all the time work with uh, an organizational structure that supports uh, the vision of building a city for people. So you can no longer design a project in Copenhagen today without having that project start in the uh, department for, um, for city design, it's called today. I think in, uh, in Boston there's a, a cultural issue as well that um, you know, there, every country has its city that has its most difficult drivers and uh, I don't actually think having lived around the country I don't think that Boston does have the most difficult drivers but mm. they are a special breed but they're <laughs> just as bad as the pedestrians and I'm afraid and I ride my bike to work um, regularly but also the, the cyclists. So, and I think there's sort of a cultural difference in nobody wants to back off first. Mm. So there's, um, I think we all behave equally badly. And so I think we can, we can change infrastructure and I think we must change infrastructure. But I'm curious if you have examples of sort of curing the social, the, the cultural problem <laughs> along with the, uh, the infrastructural problem and does, does one necessarily fix the other? No, but it's, uh, it's a good point. I talked about this, the, the software and the hardware. I think it's about awareness of these things. Um, I would definitely argue that um, if you have the right infrastructure so that people do feel invited and safe, you will start having different types of riders and you will not only have the ones that are not giving away their right, but you will start having more you know, families and the ones like me that are sitting up cycling with a basket in front, um, sort of urban and civilized. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I think, um, uh, I think you can do campaigns as well. I think Copenhagen, uh, the, the Danish Cycling Federation has been wonderful at uh, making campaigns. Like one example uh, could be um, the one that I told you about the, 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 the people that are employed by the city to clean your bike and show you how to park it. Uh, another one is um, uh, you would once in a while, there would be uh, a cycling day of the year and, uh, and you would see, um, maybe a guy standing uh, uh, with a big sign saying cyclists are happier people than the ones driving cars. And when you see that sign when you, when you, when you cycle past, you actually, you actually become more happy, right? Uh, there's always also been other uh, campaigns where, uh, where politicians have been out giving uh, 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 bread to, to people cycling, like a morning, a basket with, uh, with, with breakfast uh, from the local bakery, just, uh, just as politicians showing the people of Copenhagen that we care uh, about the fact that you are cycling and, and, and thank you for doing that. Please continue doing that. So you can, you can do all sorts of campaigns uh, uh, that uh, addresses uh, these issues in a soft way and try to, uh, to, to foster or invite for the right type of uh, attitude and behavior. Uh, having said that, uh, Copenhagen now have the latest survey we, we did, um, bicycle account showed that uh, um, congestion on bicycle tracks are now a real issue. And uh, uh, people think that um, uh, the attitude amongst the cyclists have become worse because of it. 
So if you go to uh, Denmark's third largest city called Odense, and you try cycling there, it's much more relaxed. And people coming from elsewhere in the country now feel that attitude is becoming worse in Copenhagen because we have this congestion problem on, on the cycle tracks. So what the city is now doing is that they're widening the cycle tracks to, uh, to the double. And they're taking out cars from certain streets, only allowing public transport and bicycles. And, and they're making a system uh, now. I didn't have any pictures of that, but they have little arrows so that on the outside of the cycle tracks, you can, f you can, do you can go fast. And on the inside of the bicycle tracks, you can do the slow urban cycling. So. We have time for probably about two more questions. So talking about scale, you, you, um, where am I looking? Uh, there. Over here. <laughs> uh, you spoke a bit about street scale and, and, and we all know kind of when the street becomes changes from a balanced street to one that's overwhelmingly car dominant. And you talk about Times Square as an example, we're, we're hmm. back to a balanced street. Uh, there's a lot of discussion here about complete streets, guidelines and policies, which is good. But in your research and your planning, have you come up with balanced street guidelines to prevent cities from, you can do a complete street, but it's not a balanced street. Hmm. And, and so, you know, we still have in the suburbs here, we're building shopping malls that are car dominant with wide curb lanes, uh, turning radius and so forth. Hmm. How do we go to the guidelines that are, that are require balanced streets? Ones that I can jaywalk across. If I want hmm. To. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, we have done tons of guidelines and tons of toolboxes and uh, so forth. Um, but I don't know. I, I kind of, uh, I, I have stopped believing a little bit in those guidelines. Um, uh, maybe it works in very well developed planning uh, systems and in cities that are very well regulated somehow. But we have found that um, all the guidelines we've done, for example, for uh, developing cities like Mexico or cities in China, or people don't read guidelines. People don't under necessarily understand guidelines and implement guidelines. I think what is, what is, that's why I, I showed this, this graph with the vision and the qualities. I think we have to have uh, a stronger focus on the vision and the balanced vision. Uh, and we have to keep that as a checkpoint all the time in the design that we do. Um, and, then, um, and then really make sure that the qualitative guidelines we have is not just about uh, we need five meters between these trees, or we need a sidewalk, have to be da da da, or we actually have to design a quality street and a balanced network, as you say, and, and that's, uh, that's political. That's, uh, that's about leadership. It's not about technical specifi specificities or details. It's actually about having the guts to do it right every time. Uh, and in every neighborhood, also when you're out working in the suburbs. So I don't really have the right answer to that. I think, uh, I think guidelines are fine. I think uh, uh, the complete street program that you have here in Boston is, is, is great. Uh, I guess it's still new. Uh, so you still have to see the, uh, wait to see the full results of how it's going to, going to be used. And, and implement it. Um, but more importantly is probably the transportation visioning that, uh, that you will be able to uh, take forward in the city uh, from now on with the new mayor and the new leadership. Great. Um, is this on? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a parking question, which is probably one of the most contentious issues probably worldwide for putting in bike infrastructure or even widening a sidewalk is what's going to happen to the parked cars. So do you have an answer? And, <laughs> and, and One answer. In, in the examples when you said these squares used to be parking lots mm. and now they're squares, what happened to the parking? And when you're taking away a lane to put in a cycle track, uh, I'm assuming that they had on-street parking at mm. one point, 
where where do you then leave the cars? So or let the people leave their cars. Yeah. So the parking, uh, I it's interesting question because in Copenhagen, since the 70s, the city has taken away 2 to 3% of parking every year, not substituted elsewhere. Just m removing parking. There is much too much parking in cities today. Copenhagen has about 6,000 parking lots left. And other cities we have, com we have surveyed, Seattle has 60,000 parking lots downtown, not including the private ones, just public street, on-street parking. So it's about changing culture. And you can only do that by actually taking away parking and then substituting with the new thing, which is bicycle infrastructure or more public transport. So that with time, <coughs> you change the modal split and people figure out not to bring their car. Another thing that Copenhagen uh, uh, city is doing is that every time there is uh, 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 too much fight about parking uh, and, there, and people cannot park and so forth, they raise up the price for parking. So every once in a while, the price will go up. And uh, So people uh, find out that it's too expensive. And they figure out different ways. Um, we also pay 200% tax on cars in Denmark. Uh, fuel, fuel price is pretty much the same as here. But we pay a lot for the, for the, for the cars. So that's, of course, another uh, incentive from the government in, uh, in Denmark to have people use public transport instead. Thanks. All right, we have one last question behind you. <coughs> Thank you very much. And you know, there's a lot of great information sort of the back and forth from point A to point B. But I guess I'm wondering, maybe it's a very simple question, sort of where does everyone keep their bikes at home? Um, you know, especially in an older city with older buildings or people walking them up and down apartments, everyone leave them in front, behind, because obviously that's a big issue in the city is sort of where we don't just park our bike in front of our houses necessarily all the time or they'll yeah. disappear. So I'm just am curious. There's a lot of point A to point B conversation, but I feel like that piece is somehow missed. Yeah. Oh, I could do a whole lecture on parking of cycles. It's, uh, we, we had a competition about that. There's uh, cycles all over the place in Copenhagen. Um, uh, you cannot park your bicycle in the pedestrian streets. You have it to do it in the, in the side streets. Uh, most of the, um, the built fabric in Copenhagen is uh, built around courtyards. So we will have like a block structure with a, with a courtyard in the middle. Uh, so uh, that's how most of the uh, urban blocks are built. So people can actually take their bicycle either and park it on the sidewalk. But most people take it inside the, the, the gate and park it. Uh, in the courtyard, um, so it's kind of in a semi-private space. Uh, in the newer uh, buildings, you will see people bring their bicycle up on the balconies, but that's rare. That's only in the in the new buildings where there will there are lifts. Most uh, most buildings in Copenhagen are uh, unfortunately uh, very old, uh, so they don't all, all of them have lifts. Um, and not a lot of people are willing to carry their bicycle upstairs. So thank you so much, everyone, for, for coming. Uh, and uh, I'm going to take a little bit of executive privilege and tell you for a couple of reasons why I thought it was so wonderful, because I'd like everybody to think of it in those terms. Um, at one point, you had a slide that said, here are things you'd like us to think about uh, as we plan our transportation system. To me, what your talk was really about, the concept of a, metro, a metropolis for people, was why we need to take a profound look at our transportation system. And I hope everybody here walks out of this room with the commitment to be an advocate for a really important round of planning, because I suspect everybody here aspires to a metropolis for people. And we've been that, that inspiration has been really helped along, I think, by you tonight. I also want to thank you for combining passion and pragmatism. 
uh, I believe that people love pictures, but they listen to numbers. And you gave us a great many. And this presentation, and that's all good. This presentation is going to be online at some point. Please, everybody, memorize all the numbers she gave us because these are great arguing points. No, what said, discussion points when you're talking to your friends and colleagues. And finally, I'm just going to finish with one number and then one observation. Um, uh, in Washington, D.C., I don't know the number for Boston, but I bet Benit does, uh, it costs about $10,000 a year for a household to own an additional car. So uh, one of the sort of equity arguments uh, that I think Halle made was by creating such a wonderful environment for bikes, we are also offering people a chance to save a lot of money to be able to live close together in cities. Uh, to be able to have dollars to spend on other aspects of, of their life. And I think that's really important. It's great to say, own one less car. It becomes meaningful when you give people a real and wonderful alternative. And uh, finally, I want to remind everybody that, oh, I know what. Um, when a city asks us, what's the most important thing we can do, and this is all, basically what they always ask, to attract jobs and investment, we would probably say, Listen to Helle's lecture, because all the things that she talked about are not just about people, about creative, well, because they're about people, they are also ground zero for economic development today, because we live in a world dominated by knowledge industries, knowledge industries, most important resource are, are brains and bright people and creative people and people who come together and talk and innovate and discover each other and are surprised by chance meetings and everything she said was about making a city competitive in the 21st century. So thank you. Uh, because, oh, clap again. <laughs> uh, uh, she hopefully will also inspire everyone to come to the next two talks. So uh, on uh, February 20th, uh, Ryan Chin is going to talk, and it'll, it'll talk in many ways will complement by going from bikes to other sorts of personal kinds of technology that we can all use to move around in ways that do bring us together. And then on March 1st, everyone who wanted to come here, John Powell, and even those who didn't, hopefully uh, will come to hear him here to talk about equity and transit, because that's really important. 21st, even more important, come to the 21st, okay. Uh, and finally, I want to thank the Barr Foundation again, because uh, cities that have a foundation that is really willing to invest in their futures and thinking about their futures are lucky cities, and we're lucky to have the Barr Foundation support events like this. So thank you all very much, and see you in February and March. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.